You can go ahead and have a seat. What an incredible start to our weekend. What an incredible start to our day. If we've never had a chance to meet before, my name is John, and I serve here as one of our pastors. I get to spend most of my time in DeLand, leading our DeLand location, and I count it a privilege to be here sharing the Word of God with you on this Mother's Day weekend. Can we celebrate all the moms in the house, Journey Church? And here at Journey Church, we're throwing a party. We're celebrating. You've already heard a little bit of what we're doing today, but we're celebrating not just the moms. We're celebrating all the women who we count as important in our life, all the ladies in the house. And so for you today, this weekend, would you go all out to show the women in your life how much you appreciate them and how much you love them. And guys, can we just admit it? They've beat us, right? They're way better than us. We don't even compare, don't even try. And so this weekend, make sure you say it with your mouth and express it with your actions. Well, hey, we're in the middle of a series called Bad Vibes. And so over the last two weeks, our lead pastor has been preaching God's word. And I don't know about you, maybe by raise of hands, make sure in Deltona or in City or online, kind of nudge your neighbor. How many of you had the moment I've had over the last two weeks where you're like, man, this is convicting. Like anybody have that experience? Like he's talking right to me. God is speaking right to me. And so what's also been so incredible is it's been so practical. And each day of the week, I've been able to think about the things God has taught us and apply them to those moments in life where we experience bad vibes, conflict. And the truth is, conflict is hard. Can we kind of let our guard down real quick this, this, this weekend and just kind of nudge your neighbor and let them know like conflict is hard. Conflict is hard. None of us have this whole thing figured out. But here's what I know. Here's what I know. Young people in the house, you need to learn this. Old people in the house, you, we need to still learn this, right? The cer- there's a certain degree of happiness or unhappiness in your life that will be 100% connected to the way you learn to handle conflict. Let me say that again. There will be a certain amount of happiness you can experience in life or miss out on that will be directly connected to how you handle conflict. Because the truth is, you can't avoid it, right? The only way to avoid conflict would be to do what? to avoid human beings 100%, right? I mean, that's the only way. If you became a monk out in the desert somewhere, these days you'd also have to disconnect yourself from all technology and social media, right? You'd have to totally disconnect yourself from people. And if you did that, a lot of us introverts in the house are like, that sounds amazing, John. That sounds incredible. But the truth is that if you did that, you still wouldn't be happy, would you? Because God created you and me to exist in relationships with other people. And in our broken world with sinners like me, broken people like you, imperfect people all over the place, conflict is inevitable. Bad vibes will begin to find you no matter what when you have relationships with people. And let's face it, some of our greatest regrets, some of our greatest hurts, some of our greatest hangups in life are directly connected from past experiences with conflict in relationships. Can I get an amen out there in the place? You see, all of us are wired a little bit differently when it comes to conflict. There's some people in the house today that when it comes to conflict, you are the fighters. Can I hear it from the fighters in this place? What that means is when you see a conflict, all your childhood, like soccer games and football games start rushing back in your mind. And for you, it's a zero sum game. There's going to be one winner and one loser in this situation. And by all means necessary, I'm going to be the what? The winner, right? The fighters in the house. And then there's a group of us that you're the runners. Any runners? in the house. And for you, maybe some back, some past experiences with, with conflict, you see conflict and you avoid it like it's the plague, right? So at your workplace, conflict starts to erupt and you're the person who just kind of conveniently slips out the back door and is no longer in the room. Like for you, you run from conflict as fast as you can. And then there's a third group of us that for lack of a better term, I'm gonna call them the bottlers. And they're the ones you gotta watch out for the most, I think. They're the ones among us who bottle it all up. And here's what it is. The bottlers, they don't run from conflict. And they also don't fight in the midst of conflict. A bottler does this. They want to engage the conflict, but they want it to end quickly. And so what they've learned to do to to end the conflict quickly is to do what? To just give in. 
to yield to whatever the other person wants. And so what they do when there's a conflict, they engage quickly, they don't run, but they just say, okay, whatever you want, right? We'll do that. The conflict ends, life gets back to normal, but what has in reality happened? They haven't actually dealt with the issue at hand. And so where did that issue go? It got bottled up. And one day in the future, it might be a week from now, it might be two years from now, something's gonna hit them from the wrong angle and what's gonna happen? All of that stuff that's been bottled up is gonna do what? It's gonna come out and it's going to explode on everyone, right? And so we got the fighters, the runners, and the ones who bottle it all up. Can you kind of just remind your spouse or your kid in the house, like which one of them that, that they are, right? Or remind your mom and dad. And so here's the deal. Depending on what combination you find yourself in when it comes to conflict, it can lead to all kinds of situations, right? I mean, you get a marriage where there's two fighters married to one another, you guys better get ready, right? I mean, you better buckle your seatbelts. There's about to be some throw down all, I mean, all out fights, arguments in that place, right? You get a fighter and a runner in the same household or workplace, what's gonna happen? Anybody can relate to this. The runner's gonna do what? Run. And the fighter's gonna do what? Run after them because they're not going to let them get away. And we're going to say, we're going to deal with this right now. And the runner's like, no, 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 no. I need to calm down. And in the Bible, it teaches us that in your anger, do not sin. And what that tells me is that all of us have a threshold when it comes to anger. Where as long as we don't let it go past the threshold, we can experience anger and not do something stupid, right? <laughs> but for all of us, there's a point. If we let anger go past that point, what's going to happen? We're going to say something. We're going to lose control of our thoughts, our words, our actions, and we're going to say something that hurts the other person. So if you get a runner and a fighter in the same workplace, same house, the runner's going to run. The fighter's not going to let them. And what are they doing in that process? They're provoking the runner. And what are they going to do? They're going to let them have it. They're going to say something they probably don't mean. They're going to hurt them. And what happens next is then the fighter gets hurt, and they're going to hurt back, and then they're going to hurt back. And it goes back and forth. And what one of my pastor friends calls the toilet bowl syndrome of relationships. Anybody relate to this? It's the tick for tack back and forth. You said this, so I'm going to say it back and I'm going to cut low and then you're going to cut lower. And it's this back and forth. And the reality, if we're honest, no matter what combination of how people handle conflict in your life, if we're honest, this back and forth can go on for years to the point where all that is felt in that relationship is resentment, anger, and hurt. And what happens in that moment is we begin to feel like our relationship has become like the rat's nest tangled mess of your fishing line when it gets all messed up. Anybody ever felt like that in a relationship? And we realize, man, I don't know what to do. And so what do you do when your relationship becomes a tangled absolute mess? is you begin to go to your mom or your dad for help or your best friend or maybe your pastor or maybe, best case scenario of all, you go to a Christian counselor, right? And you go up to them and you put your rat's nest of a relationship and all of its tangled mess on the table and you say, fix me. And you're asking them, hey, can you help me sort through in this friendship or in my marriage or my relationship with my son or daughter, how all these tangles work together. Will you help me sort out my past? And a lot of times what we're trying to get them to do is help us trace it back to the beginning to prove to her it's all her fault, right? <laughs> or to prove to him it all started with him. And what happens, just to let you in on a little secret, is there is no counselor, there is no pastor, there is no person on this planet who can take the rat's nest tangled mess of your relationship and trace it back into your past to figure out how it all started and how it all tangled up. And so when we begin to realize that, what do we do? We feel the temptation to say, I don't know that there's hope for this mess. And so we're tempted to cut the line and move on to the next relationship. And if we're honest, the biggest hurts and regrets of our life is the trail of relationships, the tangled messes in our past, the friendship after friendship after friendship, or the workplace that turned toxic, and then the next workplace that turned toxic, and the next workplace that turned toxic, or the life group 
that didn't go the way you expected, that went toxic in the next life group, in the next life group, or maybe the church that didn't go the way you expected, and then the next mess of a church, and the next mess of a church, and some of the ones that hurt the most are our best friends, or the marriage after marriage after marriage, and we're left wondering, is there even a hope when it comes to conflict? And that's what we've been looking at over this Bad Vibes series. And here's the truth as we get started today. Is the truth is this. You can't change your past. What happened, happened. But what you can change is your pattern as you go forward. Even if today you find yourself in a relationship that is this tangled mess, the toilet bowl syndrome is going, it's resentment that you feel like there's no hope. What I want to encourage you with this weekend in the word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit is that even in whatever situation you're in now, there is hope if you begin to change your pattern going forward. That's what I want to share with you this weekend. But in order to get there, to the one point I want to leave you with, I want to recap what we learned two weeks ago with Pastor James. And so in the book of James, chapter four, this is God speaking through James, the brother of Jesus. Um, And in James four, verses one and two, he says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? What's the cause of all this? And he says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have, so you kill or you slander. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Now, here's one of those passages that shows me that God's word is true. I mean, this was before any modern psychology, any modern philosophy, and yet in the word of God, he is laying bare the way human beings work. And what he's telling you is that when you experience bad vibes from someone else or you experience the bad vibes from within, when conflict finds you, you can know this to be true. The vibe goes bad when you don't get what you want. Did you see that in the text? This is what Pastor James taught us two weeks ago. If you missed it, go back and watch it. What he's saying is how does conflict form in our life? It's when you want something or need something and you don't get it. That underneath all conflict, there are desires that are unmet. Husbands in the place, have you ever had the experience that I have where all of a sudden you find yourself in an argument of all things over dishes in the kitchen sink, right? And you begin to get into this argument over dishes of all things, and all of a sudden it starts to occur to you, it seems like we're fighting about dishes, but I think she's mad about something else. Like anybody else ever have that experience? And what James is teaching us in God's word is you're right, that underneath every conflict, Underneath every conflict, there is something deeper than what you see on the surface. There are always unmet desires within you that are warring against each other. And so Pastor James taught us to ask this question. It's very practical. Before you respond, pause and ask this question. What is it that I want? What do I want? And you begin to ask. And so what James is teaching us is the human heart has been built to desire all kinds of things, to desire to be seen to be appreciated, to be respected, to be loved, to be protected, to be safe, to avoid pain. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And so in that moment where you feel the bad vibe kind of raging up inside of you, the fighter's about to come out, you pause and you ask, what is it that I want that I'm not getting? And what we begin to do in that moment is you take that desire to the Lord and say, God, is this a godly desire? Is this a sinful desire? Am I going to the wrong place with it? And you begin to deal with that desire that you're not getting with the Lord. But here's what would be wise of us, is knowing what it says in James chapter four, then we also know there's another person in the conflict. And what that teaches us is that not only is that true of us, but if they're involved and there's something that they need, want, or desire that they're not getting, And so we'd be wise in any conflict to ask this question. What is it that they want? What do they want? And this one, you can do internally in your own mind and think about, but this is where it gets a little uncomfortable, is this works best when you actually ask the person 
actual questions, right? And so you have to communicate. And so the way that this works sometimes is in the middle of the household, maybe in the marriage, there's a fighter and a runner. The runner's trying to run. The fighter's saying, no, 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 you can't get away. We need to deal with this right now. And so in that moment, runners, you need to let them be for a little bit to cool off, right? You need to let them be. And runners, you need to communicate that you're not running from it forever. You need to communicate to the fighter that, hey, we're going to deal with this, but let me cool down first. And in that moment, when you cool down, you have to begin to ask questions, trying to find out what is it that they want that they're not getting. And so you might say something like this, help me understand. Can everybody say that? One, two, three, help me understand. Ask your spouse, ask your kids, ask your boss, your coworkers, help me understand what it is that I've done to upset you. Help me understand what was the expectation that I let you down on. Help me understand What was the thing you wanted that I stood in the way of you getting? And as you begin to ask those questions, what God will do is he'll begin to reveal to you what it is, what desire was at war within them that they wanted and they didn't get. Man, just with that, if we pause there, that would be enough wisdom that in most of our conflicts, if we would just do these steps, we would have a lot greater potential to walk in peace, wouldn't we? But here's what I want to remind you. It's not enough just to do these two steps. If there's not a shift in your heart, a shift in your mind in that moment, it's possible to know what they want and what you want and to still have the toilet bowl spinning, right? It's still possible that in that moment you still hurt each other back and forth. And so that brings us to the point that I want to leave us with this week. And it's found in Philippians chapter 2 starting in verse one. And so if you would turn there, it says this, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship in the spirit, if any affliction or compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Let's pause there for a second. So the apostle Paul, God's speaking through him to this group of Christians that are a part of a church, they're in relationships. And what you catch from him in these passages is he's saying is if there's any desire to be unified, if there's any desire for you to operate in peace, then do what I'm about to tell you. And so if there's a desire in you, in your relationships to experience conflict and to make it through them with peace and to have the ability to resolve it, then do what he's about to tell us. And here's what it is, verses three and four. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I don't want us to gloss over that passage really quickly. I want us to pause for a second and dig in. What does this passage not say? It does not say, learn what they need and stop there, does it? It says there's something else you got to do, right? And it doesn't say, learn what their needs are and consider them as equal to yours. Does it say that? It says, actually, you go even further, right? It says, no, 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 no. But with humility, consider one another as what? More important than yourselves. That's crazy. (laughs) That is radical. And so do you see in the text, I don't want to move too quickly until you see it. What God is teaching us is in any relationship and in any conflict, the shift that has to happen in your heart is I have to get to the point in that moment where I begin to prioritize their wants over mine. I begin to prioritize their wants over mine. Do you see that in the text? And what that teaches us is that naturally, we're not gonna wanna do that, are we? And I'll just be honest with you. For me, if, I, if you were to leave me all by myself in what I want, In that moment of conflict, whose needs, desires, and wants do I place in the middle? Mine, if I'm honest, right? And that's the deal. Like with my kids, if I'm honest, 
Left to myself, naturally, I'm going to put my wants and wishes as most important in my relationship with my kids. I'm going to come home and say, man, they just need to know how hard I worked all day, and they don't need to annoy me, and they need to do everything I've asked them to do without asking any questions. And if they do anything like that, they've disrespected me. They need to put my needs and wishes first, right? And when it comes to marriage, there's all kinds of materials out there when it comes to marriage and relationships where you have tools to learn how your spouse is wired. Anybody ever take the color personality test, right? There's Myers-Briggs. You can learn how people are wired. And for marriage, there's all kinds of books like his needs and her needs and the love languages, right? And we learn how each other are wired and what love language we speak and how we can fill each other's love cup, right? There's all those different resources. But if I'm honest, it doesn't matter how much I know about my wife, Becca. If I'm honest, left to myself, what do I do? <laughs> I put my needs, my love languages, my wiring as more important, and she needs to accommodate to me. Am I the only one in the room that feels that way? Like, and what I do is I start to say, no, 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 no. I start getting mad, and I'm like, she should know my love language, and she should feel my love language. She should serve me. And then when it comes to my workplace, what do I do? I start to put my needs at the center. And I start to get frustrated, like people should just know that I'm grumpy on Monday mornings and to leave me alone. Like people should just know I don't answer emails before noon. So stop getting upset if I don't answer your email before noon. Or hey, don't you know that in my personality, that my lowest part of the day when it comes to energy is after 2 p.m.? So who in the world are you to try to schedule a meeting with me at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? And I start getting frustrated because I'm putting my needs and expecting everyone to accomplish accommodate them. If you keep putting your own needs in the center, what will happen? It doesn't matter how well you know the other person, you'll continue to perpetuate the bad vibes back and forth, the toilet bowl syndrome of relationships. But think about what would change if we did what God just taught us to do in Philippians 2. If in that moment I pause and I've learned what they need and they're not getting and I decide, no, 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 even though I don't feel like it, I'm going to prioritize your wants over mine. That's the game changer that can change the pattern of your relationships going forward. This has the potential to bring transformation into the messiest kind of rat's nest of tangled mess of relationships you find yourselves in. Because in that moment, what that leads you to ask, if you're going to say, man, your wants are more important than mine, my kids' wants are going to be more important than mine. My spouse's wishes are going to be more important than mine. Her love language is a way for me to understand how I can prioritize her. My coworkers, my boss, my employees, they're going to be more important to me than my own wishes. It leads you to ask this question when a conflict arises. What can I do to help meet their need? You see, with every conflict, you're going to have a choice of what words will you speak next? What actions will you take next? And in that moment, if you begin to prioritize their needs as more important than your own, you'll begin to ask, what can I do? What can I say that will help meet their needs? This is where the game changer begins to play out. You see, there are some things that people want of you that you can't give them, amen? Like my, my son probably would want from me $1 million. Dad, give me $1 million. And that would be incredible to give that to him if that's what he says he wants. And I could prioritize his wants all I want, but I don't have a million dollars to give him. There will be some things people want from you you just can't give them. There'll be some things people want from you that you weren't meant to give to them. God was meant to give that to them, right? But there are some things in every conflict that you can do or say that do help meet their needs. And so you have to ask the question, don't let all those exceptions deter you from putting this into practice. What can I do to help meet their need? Think about the, how that would change the way you view conflict. Man, in your marriage, what would change in the moment of the argument? What would be different? If you began to make this shift and ask this question, what actions would you begin to take? You see, for some of us with our teenagers, right? 
They come home from school, you ask them to clean the room or take the trash out, and some days they just explode on you, right? I mean, they're just as rude as can be, and you're like, man, I'm gonna prove the point right now, and they need to learn responsibility, and if they don't learn responsibility in this moment, they're gonna lose their job one day, they're not gonna get into college, all these things we start to play out in our mind. And in that moment, if we begin to make this shift, we begin to ask questions, what might be underlying their response, and how can I begin to meet their need, right? At your workplace, I don't know if anything like this has ever happened. This is 100% hypothetical. Maybe in your office, like there's some bad vibes erupting over the copy machine. Anybody ever have bad vibes around the copy machine? And it usually involves like people aren't putting paper back in the copier. Who would have known the bad vibes that are very serious when it comes to paper in the copy machine, right? And so you're going through your day, you're making some copies, and all of a sudden you encounter conflict at the copy machine in the workroom, and all of a sudden you realize someone's upset with you because you didn't put paper back in the copier. And in that moment, what is it that you need that you're not getting? Well, probably what you need in that moment. And when I'm thinking about it, like I just want to move on with my day. I'm making a quick copy. I'm moving on. I'm not even thinking about it. But you begin to realize that there's another person who seems really upset about the copy paper in the copier, right? And so you begin to do what we're talking about. Okay. What is it that they need that they're not getting? And as you begin that conversation, you begin to realize that this person has, has the kind of job where they use the copier all day long, and all these people like you keep swooping in and making your copies and swooping out using paper and not ever checking how much is in there, and they feel like they're literally the only one at the whole workplace that ever replaces the copy paper. And what's the need that they have? Well, it seems like the need that they have is just to be seen. Like, I feel like no one appreciates me. I feel like no one sees me or values my job and what I do. I feel a little unappreciated and unneeded. And so I begin to ask the question at my workplace, well, what can I do to help meet their need? And as you begin to ask that, even in a simple conflict, you begin to see, hey, one of the things I could do is take 10 seconds extra every time I make a copy copy and check the paper and put another ream of paper in there. And maybe even more importantly, as I learn this about the person, seek to understand, I can make the change to say, well, sometimes I could just go out of my way to let them know how much I appreciate them and what they do. And I could begin to love them in the midst of the conflict. You see, that's what begins to change when you view things through this lens. I was trying to think of a good example from my own life where God's taught me this. And what came to mind is uh, a few years ago, um, I was asked to preach on the weekend like I'm doing this weekend. And I love being able to share God's word with our people. It's one of my favorite things in the whole world. But I've got to be honest with you. It's pretty intimidating. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen you before, like (laughs) from up here, but you're pretty intimidating, right? And then I begin to think about how overwhelming it is because James, Pastor James makes it look so easy. He's probably the best there is at what this is, right? And so I look at what he does, but it's a lot harder than it looks. And when I start to think about, hey, for about 30 to 40 minutes, sometimes longer, like it's just going to be me right? In front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And it's just me talking. Like no one else is up here talking, keeping your attention. No other instrument is playing. Like it's literally just me. And that begins to be overwhelming. And you begin to feel like this is pretty vulnerable. Like this is, this is a vulnerable position to be in. And then you add in like what preaching actually is. What preaching actually is, is you're asking God, show me a truth in your word and do a work in my heart that changes me and allow me to share that with a group of people. I'll just let you in on a little secret. When pastors preach, they're mainly preaching to themselves. That's what we're doing. And so there's a vulnerability in what is being shared. And we try to open up our life and say, hey, here's how God showed this to me. And so this particular weekend, I was preaching and I began to share the story of how God was convicting me and how this related to my family. And so I shared a story that involved my family, my wife, and my kids, and I shared that as part of the sermon. And the weekend went amazing, it was awesome. And then I go back to work on Monday morning, and they're waiting for me on my computer, and Outlook is what? An email, right? Anybody ever get an email before? (laughs) Or a text message like that? And when I began to read this email, there are bad vibes, everywhere, man. It is apparent that this person is upset, like mad at me, (laughs) like mad at me. And I'm reading this and they're mad at me because of the story that I shared in the sermon about my family. 
And now all of a sudden, I had the greatest quiet time that morning. I had coffee, like I love coffee. But all of a sudden, I read this email, and not only are there bad vibes coming from my computer screen, but there's bad vibes starting to well up within me. Amen. Ever been there before? And I start to feel all those things inside, and I'm like, man, they don't even understand. This is so off base. They don't realize how much work I put into this, man. They don't realize how vulnerable I feel. All this stuff's going on in my mind. Well, let them speak for 40 minutes and let them share things about their life and let's see how much complaining that they do there. And in the courtroom of my mind, I'm already having the argument and I'm already beginning to become the fighter. I'm ready to call them up, have a meeting, and I'm ready to fight and argue my point and do what? Win. I'm going to show them I'm right and they're wrong. They're off base. Man, I'm in the complete right. And in that moment, as we look through this grid, I begin to ask this, this, this question, what is it that I want that I'm not getting in that moment? Well, really what's, what I want in that moment is I want people to value me, right? I want people to appreciate what I did, right? And I start to bring that to the Lord. Look, God, is that okay that I'm feeling this way? Like, should my validation come from this person or from you? And so I'm dealing with that on my side. But then as I begin to think about it, why are they upset? What is it that they need that they're not getting? And I begin to read the rest of the email. And what I begin to understand is the reason they're upset is when they came into the room, they were carrying a very heavy burden. They were hurt. They were walking through one of the most difficult situations they had ever walked through. And then they began to share that they were in the midst of a family that was being torn apart that there was some estrangement with their kids and with their spouse. And so when I shared that story, it triggered some things in them that made them upset. And in that moment, everything that I felt was, man, they should meet my need of being validated, of feeling important, of being appreciated. And in that moment, all I wanted to do was go and prove my point that I'm right and they're in the wrong. And what God in the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me is he began to lead me to ask that question, Is there something I can do to help meet their need? And what I began to think through is put myself in their shoes. Like what if I was experiencing the brokenness and the hurt and the trial that they were walking through? You know what I would probably feel in that moment? Is I'd probably feel really alone. Like no one else understands what I'm walking through. Like I probably would feel like I need someone just to show that they understand what I'm walking through and to point me to the hope because I'm starting to feel like God doesn't even love me. And what I began to ask is what can I do then in order to help meet their need? And what God began to reveal to me in the Holy Spirit is maybe what I could do, I can't fix the situation, I'm not God. I can't heal the hurt, I'm not the Lord. But what can I do? I can go listen to their story and let them know that there's at least one person that hears them, that sees them, and I can encourage them to find hope in the Lord. I don't know how your situation's gonna work out, but I do know my God, and my God tells me that he is near the brokenhearted, which means if you're brokenhearted, God's gonna walk through this with you. And I began to see what I can do is give time to hear them and to encourage them. And what started out, here's the key, what started out with me tempted to go prove my point, what would that have resulted in? I would have ruined all chance to have any relationship with this person, wouldn't I? I would have proved my point. (laughs) I would have walked away feeling like a winner, but I would have walked away losing a friend. And what I began to realize is if you sever that connection, that relationship, you actually lose the ability to influence them for the Lord. And this is the key. When you begin to make this shift in your mind when it comes to conflict, what you begin to understand is what God was teaching me in that moment is that bad vibes are always, everybody say always. Always. Bad vibes are always an opportunity to show love, not just to prove a point. Bad vibes are always, always, an opportunity to show the very love of Christ, to serve someone in that moment and not just to prove your point to them. Man, what would change in your life if you began to walk in these steps in the power of the Holy Spirit? What might change? Man, it changes the whole paradigm. You see, what you would begin to do, parents, we need to hear this. Parents, when your kids are small, when they're one or two years old, you can lean heavily on the leg of your authority 
in your physical ability, can't you? Your one or two year old crawls or runs out into the street, they're going to get killed. And what can you do? You don't have to just say, hey, come out, like choose to come out. No, you're saying, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, come out of the street. And if they don't come out of the street, you come and you pick them up and move them out of the street. You can lean on your authority when your kids are one or two years old. But here's the deal, parents is every tick of the clock, every hour that goes by, every day, every year, your ability to influence them through your authority and your physical strength is of trickling away. And there will be a day as a parent when your son or daughter moves out of your house and begins to live life on their own two feet. And if all you ever did was learn to influence them by your authority and your physical strength, then in that moment, you've given up all influence in their life. But when you begin to realize that just like with every relationship, the influence you have with your kids, just like your spouse, just like your friends, just like your coworkers, is directly correlated to the relationship, the connection you have, then in those moments, your teenager is bucking the system and everything in you wants to prove the point and make the point to them, in that moment by the Holy Spirit, you start to realize that sometimes you making the point, even if you're right, you do so sacrificing the relationship on the altar of you being right. And in that moment, you're beginning to sever your ability to have influence at all. And so with your kids, with your friends, with your wife, with your husband, with your mom, your dad, your siblings, your coworkers, what would change if you began to see bad vibes as an opportunity to serve, to put their needs ahead of yours and to say, God, use me in this moment? And it would change everything. Has the ability to inject love in the middle of hurt has the ability to inject the very mercy and grace of Jesus in the middle of the rat's nest tangled mess of the relationship you've made. And when you do that, you better get ready. It has the ability to turn the tides of the toilet bowl syndrome, the back and forth and begin to bring healing even in the midst of the mess. I've seen it. How do I know this? I can almost hear the, the kind of pushback. Well, John, that's impossible. That's hard. If you knew the conflict I was in, there's no way I could do that. Well, here's how I know it can change it because that's how Jesus changed me. The reason I know it can change the story is that's how Jesus changed you. That's why Paul says, after he taught this, consider the needs of others as more important than yourselves. Look at verse five. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he was already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held onto, but he emptied himself by taking the very form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death, and not just any death, but death on a cross. It's for this reason that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which, above, which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What the scriptures teach us is this, that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness and mercy of your father through Jesus Christ that leads you to the point of change. Repentance means a change of heart, a change of mind, a complete 180. And it was God's kindness that transformed you and transformed me. And so in that moment, John, how can I show love when they don't show it back? How can I look to serve when they never serve me back? How can I look to say, hey, how can I help when no, nothing in them wants to help me? The way you do that is you say, God, fill me with your spirit and help me have the same mindset and the same heart that Jesus had because in the greatest conflict that mankind has ever known is not between you and the lady at the copy machine. It's not between you and your wife who's a runner and you're a fighter. It's not in that. The greatest conflict that ever existed was between us and a holy God when he created everything everything that is and said, you go and enjoy it in my ways. And we looked up at him and we said, forget you, God, forget you. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. Who cares about you, God? And our God who easily could have demanded that we serve him because he's the only one who deserves it. 
Instead, Jesus looked to us, and even though he is the only one who deserved to have his needs and wishes at the center, said, no, 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 no. I'm going to choose to look to your needs, even when you're not reciprocating it, and I'm going to choose at the cost of my very life and glory, die for you. I don't think we can comprehend that. Jesus came and served and said, how can I meet their need? What did they need? They need a redeemer. They need a savior. They need a Lord. And he came and he died for you and for me. And so in that moment with your spouse, what you have to do is begin to pray, God, give me the same mindset as Christ. Give me the same power that he had. I'm not going to walk in my own strength. I'm going to walk in the strength of Jesus Christ who did this for me. And I'm going to believe that even though this is a rat's nest tangled relationship, that there looks like there's no hope, that that was where I was at. That's where our world was at. But when Jesus came for me, it changed everything. And so I'm going to believe if I choose to put their needs above mine and I say, how can I serve them and meet them in this place? And I see bad vibes as an opportunity to serve, not just prove a point. I'm going to step in believing in the same power of Jesus Christ that if I do that, it has the potential to transform the atmosphere of that relationship. That's what we begin to walk in when we see what Jesus has done for us. So would you bow your heads with me all across this place in Orange City and online and Deltona and Deland? Chances are that this message has reached a person who is in the middle of the worst conflict that anyone has ever seen, that you would say, hey, it's the worst mess that I've ever walked in. And what I want you to hear is in this moment, there's hope. And so all across, as we pray, what we're going to do is we're going to set our eyes on Jesus, the one who handled conflict perfectly. And we're going to ask him to give us the strength to walk in his ways and not ours. And so would you begin to pray, Jesus? I trust in your ways, even though it seems backwards, even though it's everything in me that's not what I want to do. All I want to do is prove my point. God, would you help me see that sometimes I sacrifice the relationship on the altar of my point? And so, God, would you help me have the same grace and mercy that Jesus, you showed me in this moment of conflict? And God, in this moment, would you help me ask What is it that I can do to help meet their needs? And I pray, God, across all our campuses and online, that in any conflict we find ourselves in, in any situation, I pray right now by the Holy Spirit, God, you would reveal to us what is the action step of service you're calling us to take this week, maybe even today, to serve someone. Because conflict is an opportunity to serve and to love, not just prove a point. Would you show it to us, Jesus? Would you give us the faith to walk in it? So God, we know we're a bunch of broken people, God. And God, as I look at our culture, I look at the time that we live in, families are broken. We've lost the ability to have civil conversations and disagreements. And everywhere we look, God, is the exact opposite of what we read in your word. And so God, I know that if we begin to walk this way, it's gonna be so countercultural that no one can help but notice how we're acting different than what is natural and what is in this world. And so God, give us the strength not to lean on our own self, not to lean on our own wisdom, but give us the strength to believe that what you've said is true and best for me. And so God, we lift up our relationships to you. God, I pray everyone within the sound of my voice, God, that you would pour out a blessing on their relationship. God, that you'd give them a new mindset. That God, you'd give them the ability to calm down in the moment of conflict and begin to ask these questions. God, that they wouldn't throw throw away the opportunity to serve and make much of you. And God, I pray as we begin to walk in your ways, that even when bad vibes are present, God, that you begin to bring the transformation that only comes through walking in the ways of Jesus. God, I pray for those that are in this place, that are hearing this sermon, God, that maybe they've never received you as their Lord and Savior. God, would you overwhelm them with the grace and love that even when they were running from you, even when they didn't deserve it, that Jesus, you were already working on their behalf. And I pray in this moment, you would give them faith to believe in the death and even even better, the resurrection of Jesus Christ for their salvation, that they would make you the Lord of their life even now. And so God, bless us in our relationships. May we glorify you in all that we do. And all God's people shouted, Amen. amen.